my life is about to be disoriented. I have traveled to 47 of the 50 states on my honeymoon. I tried the McLobster sandwich at a McDonald's in Boston. Um, I've taken pictures next to and even made contributions to the gum wall in Seattle. I've dipped my toes in the Gulf of Mexico, both the Pacific and the Atlantic. My foot has crossed the line of our northern and southern borders of the United States. But in all my 45 years, I have never used a passport to travel to a foreign country. I've experienced being disoriented. I, a small town kid doing mission work in downtown Los Angeles or Chicago or New Orleans will naturally kind of disorient a person's life. But what I'm about to endeavor feels bigger. And this church has several folks who are extensive world travelers, and your pastor orders the same two items at Arby's every week. I'm adventurous when I choose curly fries over a crinkle, okay? So, so why do I go on a trip where I purposefully put myself into a place where I'm going to be disoriented? Now, beyond the church's obvious desire to support Arvid and, and Nancy as well through their work on this translation product and their ministry throughout the years and alongside, again, celebrating their lifetime of service to the Lord, adventure is found when we allow ourselves to be disoriented. Human nature drifts towards the desire to create patterns and routine. We want comfort. We want to know what's going to happen next. It's why we eat fiber. God often wants the opposite for our lives, right? God will not tempt us, but is consistently arranging our circumstances to disorient us to the place where our faith grows. We're working through a series on praying through the Psalms and how they assist us in learning how to worship and experience a relationship with God. If you read through the Psalms, most create some form of disequilibrium, that disorientation. If it, it, it's like, kind of like being knocked off or knocked out of the way, out of kilter. Um, there, there are times that we're sad, and a psalm of praise may serve as a stark contrast to, to the somber mood that, that we approach God with. Each invites us to wrestle and work through the entire scope of human experience. And so the psalms are meant to disorient us. Walter Brueggemann wrote a book on praying through the Psalms. It's been a big help in adding content to this particular sermon. And in the book, he describes a process that we're intended to go through when we read a Psalm. And he starts by saying, A, we are to be painfully, or I'm sorry, we are being, we, A is being securely oriented, B, being painfully disoriented, and C, being surprisingly reoriented. So he says this about the danger of staying in that, that, that state of security. He says this, the first situation in this scheme, that of being securely oriented, is a situation of equilibrium. While we all yearn for it, it's not very interesting and it does not produce great prayer or powerful song. It consists in being well settled, knowing that life makes sense and God is well placed in heaven, presiding but not bothering this is the mood of much of the middle class church. What, what we do with this disequilibrium will often determine the trajectory of our growth in Christ. And typically, we have, one, we have two options. We can either dive in or we can attach this, this veneer of Christian nicety over the top of our wrestling. In two different instances, if you'll remember, when Jesus was on the cross, he was offered wine. It was an offer of mercy to help dull the pain. At least one of the offerings had, had a level of narcotic element to it that would help null and dumb the numb the intense suffering that he was intended to experience. And in one case, he rejected it completely. In the other, taste, in the other case, he tasted it and then rejected it. See, Christian nicety can serve as a similar purpose in insulating the believer from deeply experiencing God-given disequilibrium. Now, we can recite or we can parrot truth without actually 
knowing the truth. I'm going to say that one more time. We can recite or parrot the truth with, without actually knowing the truth. And now, if you grew up in church, this is a huge temptation. Well, well, I know that God works all things together for the good. I know God doesn't give us more than we can handle, but this sure is tough. And when, when Christian nicety becomes a balm in which we numb our hurt, we fail in allowing the trial to serve its purpose. We endure, but we fail to grow. Bruggeman again points out how this dilemma impacts society at large. Note that the Psalms thus, thus propose to speak about human experience in, on, in an honest, freeing way. This is in contrast to much human speech and conduct, which is in fact a cover-up. In most arenas where people live, we are expected and required to speak the language of safe orientation and equilibrium either to find it so or to pretend we find it so. For the normal, conventional functioning of public life, the raw edges of disorientation and reorientation must be denied or suppressed for the purpose of public equilibrium. As a result, our speech is dulled and mundane. Our passion has been stilled and is without imagination. And mostly the Holy One is not addressed, not because we dare not, but because God is far away and hardly seemed important. This means that the agenda and the intention of the Psalms is considerably at odds with normal speech of most people. The normal speech of a stable, functioning, self-deceptive culture in which everything must be kept running young and smooth. See, when we pray through the Psalms, we find a place where our feelings fail to disqualify us from God's love. Now, if we're doing church right, we should be unified around the gospel of Jesus Christ while maintaining some level of diversity. As a speaker to such a group, I walk a fine line in the midst of our little cancel culture going on right now. People leave the church because I'm too conservative. People leave the church because I'm not conservative enough. I've had seasons where I've been wrestling through the implications of the, of the gospel imperfectly and, and simply because I'm the pastor, they left because my understanding or wrestling wasn't perfect or it made them uncomfortable. There are other times I'm just grumpy or somber or angry or selfish and unfortunately, the church isn't often a place where th th that allows for these emotions to be worked through. And as a result, we wear these fine porcelain masks. But if you look close enough, they're cracked all the way through. And most of us despise the uncomfortable. And so we purposefully look away from those whose masks are beginning to crumble and fall apart because we hate to see the hurt behind the mask. What we fear is a lack of acceptance. We fear rejection by others. If we drop the mask and people saw how we felt, we may very well be ostracized by others. The Psalms are, are filled with the, with the type of wrestling and hurt that the church is, is uncomfortable dealing with. Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminds us our understanding of human history differs from those originally reading the Psalms. He says this, there is no theoretical answer in the Psalms to all these questions, as there are none in the New Testament. As there are none in the New Testament. The, the, the only real answer is Jesus Christ. But this answer is already sought in the Psalms. It is common to all of them that they cast every difficulty and every agony on God. We can no longer bear it. Take it from us. Bear it yourself. You alone can handle the suffering. That is the goal of all lamentation psalms. They pray concerning the one who, who took upon himself our diseases and bore our affirmities, Jesus Christ. They proclaim Jesus Christ to be the only help in suffering, for in him God is with us. See, just because we know the gospel doesn't negate 
just because we know the gospel, it doesn't negate the need to wrestle with the implications of the gospel in our lives. Jesus' death, burial, resurrection put to death the notion of God's indifference towards humanity. It did not put to death the need to wrestle through the implications of his love amidst a vast array of human emotions and struggles. See, what we often avoid is an integral part of our growth and discipleship. See, as you allow the Psalms to teach you how to, how to praise and pray, you might find the gospel inadvertently becoming a veneer, preventing you from experiencing the depth of emotion alongside the recalibration that we need, we're intended to experience in Christ. Because we know the end of the story. We know the full extent of God's love extended to us on the cross. And when the Psalms take these dark turns, we might be tempted to dismiss their difficulties as, well, that was pre-Christ and we need not deal with that anymore. No, this would be a mistake. As believers, we exist between the now and the not yet. On one hand, we stand before God and we are holy and blameless as we stand before him without a single fault. But on the other hand, we carry around this crucified flesh still flopping around, causing us grief. We are dead to this world and this life and yet we're still dying. We're perfect in Christ and yet we're still growing. Let's revisit Walter Bruggemann's simple outline being securely oriented, being painfully disoriented, being surprisingly reoriented. See, this is what discipleship looks like. This is what growth looks like. Brueggemann continues his thoughts. Thus, an evangelical understanding of reality affirms that the old is passing away, that God is bringing in newness. But we know also that there is no newness unless and until there is a serious death of the old. Thus, the complaint psalms of disorientation can can be understood not in theoretical but in quite concrete way as an act of putting off the old humanity so that the new may come. The psalms thus become a voice of the dying in which we are all engaged partly because the world is a place of death and is passing away, partly because God gives new life but only in the pain of death. It is because God is at work, even in the pain of such death, that the psalmist dares enters into God's presence with these realities. They have to do with God. Now, if, if when we pray, we try to move from being securely oriented to being surprisingly reoriented, we will not grow as we should. Spiritual teleportation is not a thing. I can't go beam me over there, Jesus, and I move from here to a place. It's like moving from point A to point C without the painful disorientation fails to produce the growth and the death, death to self that God's looking for. See, when we pray through the structure of the Lord's Prayer, we begin with, hallowed be your name. We seek to put God in his rightful place in our lives. And, and, and this is a petition of praise. It's a reorientation of our lives around God's goodness. You then might wonder how the Psalms questioning God's goodness are supposed to help in speaking our praise, right? Like we pray, hallowed be your name, and yet we're supposed to wrestle and and struggle. and, And now, now I can only speak from my own experience, but my deepest appreciation for the goodness of God has often come on the heels of my most intense trials. See, when we make the Psalms a part of our prayers, we allow them to accomplish something similar on a semi-frequent basis. We, we may begin to feel free to offer our own laments and our own struggles to God. When we experience a season of disorientation and suffering, we should, we should wrestle, we should question. Through our persistence in God's faithfulness, he has the power to surprisingly reorient our lives. We then shed our old ways of thinking and believing, putting them to death, and we mature by knowing new aspects of God's faithfulness. Our old beliefs and perceptions die, 
and new ones take their place. In a weird way, this honors God's name because our surprising reorientation allows us to see God bigger, more holy than we previously imagined. Now let me give you one piece of advice and then maybe one byproduct of these truths. And so the piece of advice is the psalmist refused to settle and and we shouldn't either. Now if we're not careful, our faith can become really trite. We can speak in terms of these spiritual platitudes. Well, in, in, in a like the Bible meets chicken soup for the soul sort of way. Like, it's always a difficult balance because, because a simple statement of truth can be beneficial to our reorientation. Often the Psalms themselves interrupt what the psalmist is feeling with a few stanzas of just truth about the character of God. Other times these statements begin the psalm. The key is we have to allow ourselves to be disoriented. When we take away the wrestling... Truth becomes something we say, but not something we know. I'm going to say that one more time. When we take away the wrestling, truth becomes something we say, but not something we know. See, we we then settle into this disconnect between what comes out of our mouths and who we are a few layers deep. We aren't supposed to settle. The psalmist encourages us to push through. We may not receive every answer we're looking for, but we should eventually rest on the goodness of God. We may have to settle for, for, we may have to settle for not knowing the answer to every question we have regarding the goodness of God's char- the character of God. And again, I'm not saying that we should refuse to settle for anything less than an in-depth answer to all of life's questions. God is not on, on the stand in your little trial or your courtroom, and we have no right to treat him as if he's on trial. I was once so deeply disturbed by the implications of the sovereignty of God, it had a crippling effect on my faith and my prayer life. Does God really control everything? Like, if he does, well, why bother praying? Are we just simple simple puppets on the end of these invisible strings? Does anyone really have a choice or, or is both this world and heaven and hell predetermined before any human being ever takes their breath? And then is that fair? Well, this sim- isn't simply wrestling for the sake of wrestling. This isn't just like, oh, I'm struggling in my theology class this week. No, these are questions that were affecting my view of the goodness of God. And so this wrestling ended up lasting months to even probably closer to a couple years. And I kept going and I refused to settle. Now, let me be clear. I did not end my wrestling having a firm grasp on every intimate detail of God's sovereign work and plan. I did, however, gain a better perspective and increased trust towards him through it. We should wrestle until we reach a point of trust. But there's also an important byproduct. See, disorientation helps keep us from self-deception. We are typically dull to our own spiritual condition. As I settle into a place of being securely oriented, I grow comfortable. And if I'm not careful, I grow carefully, I, I grow confident and maybe even prideful. I've experienced stuff. I know stuff. I can teach stuff. And if we refuse to wrestle through being disoriented, we we stay the same. And once the circumstance then clears up, we return to who we were before the trial until the next one comes. There is no growth. And it's important to know God's word, to study God's word, to obey God's word. But when we do each of these things and fail to apply its truth to our circumstances and wrestling... We create a disconnect between what we outwardly affirm to be true and who we actually are. In each of these instances, the Christ follower doesn't grow as he or she should. Disorientation is God's gift to help keep us humble and see ourselves as we really are. 
Now, there's a great irony in many faith communities. Many view our disorientation as proof that you're doing something wrong. Instead, we should view it as normal and eventually maybe even view it as a gift. When I'm disoriented, I know I don't have it all together. I'm reminded of my dependence. I see my current my current spiritual condition. I'm forced to again deal with my inadequacies and my failings. I'm drawn again to the love of God. And the byproduct is, graciously, my faith grows. And I'm reoriented around the truth of the gospel. The old perspective dies and a new one is born. Now let's work a little bit through application and illustrate what we're talking about by again praying through a psalm. And, and, and my encouragement and application today is simply this. Don't fight God's disorienting work in your life. Every prayer request we receive as a church is evidence of God's disorienting work. Now often they're health related. Some are, uh, some others, people's struggles that we are bearing alongside of them. And a few are spiritual wrestling uh, an individual is, is going through. Often the prayer is for relief from the cause of their disorientation instead of for strength to grow through it. Now maturity isn't achieved on the day that you permanently move past your disorientation and permanently enter into a season of being securely oriented. Maturity is a shift in mindset from when you face a trial. It's a shift in mindset from God, you've got to get this away as soon as possible to instead beginning to pray as long as it takes, Lord. God, keep me in these circumstances for as long as it takes for you to grow me in trust and in the righteousness of your character. Let's take another psalm and let's allow it to disorient us a bit as we work through it. So we're going to read together the sixth psalm, uh, Psalm yeah, sixth psalm. So let's read this together. Oh Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your rage. Have compassion on me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. I am sick at heart. How long, O oh Lord, until you restore me? Oh, return, O oh Lord, and rescue me. Save me because of your unfailing love. For the dead do not remember you. Who can praise you from the grave? I'm worn out from sobbing. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with tears. My vision is blurred by grief. My eyes are worn out because of all my enemies. Go away, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord will answer my prayer. May all my enemies be disgraced and terrified. May they suddenly be turned back in shame. So again, when I use the Psalms, these Psalms, and teaching me how to praise, um, again, this is kind of the whole purpose of this series, is, is, is my goal is, is to have you guys eventually learn how to use the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. How to use this prayer as an outline, but then also allow the scriptures to help inform your praise. And eventually, maybe we'll do another series someday on how to use the scriptures to pray for others. But for now, the focus is on how to praise and how to teach ourselves to praise the Lord by using the Psalms as a tool of this securely oriented, painfully disoriented, and then surprisingly reoriented sort of way. And so I'll use the Psalms in teaching me how to praise. And I, again, I take a few stanzas at a time after reading through the whole Psalm. It's always good to listen before we speak. And so then I might read, O oh Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your rage. Have compassion on me, Lord, for I'm weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. I'm sick at heart. How long, O oh Lord, until you restore me? Return, O oh Lord, and rescue me. Save me because of your unfailing love. And then I might pray something like, Father, the thought of you rebuking me in your anger, Lord, that feels so foreign. Now, I know you discipline me, Lord, but, but I tend to think of your discipline as, as coming from the hand of a loving father. 
to wrestle through your anger and rage is hard for me to work through because, because it was directed towards your son for my benefit, for our benefit, Lord. God, let us never forget your anger towards sin and your rage towards wickedness. You are righteous, O oh God. You are holy. My sins have been covered by the blood of your son, but you still are firmly against the proud. Father, I pray for your compassion because in my flesh I remain weak and incapable of living for you as I'd hoped to. I may not feel physically sick like the psalmist communicates, but, but can certainly relate to the sickness of heart. In those moments, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, and, and I live in this state of confusion. Father, I need to be surprisingly reoriented to who you are and what you want me to do. I need to see and experience your unfailing love. It's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm still surprised by you, but I am. Let my old ways of thinking die and let new conception of who you are be born anew within me. And then it says in 5 through 7, For the dead do not remember you. Who can praise you from the grave? I'm worn out from sobbing. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with my tears. My vision is blurred by grief. My eyes are worn out because of all my enemies. And then I might pray, God, I want to live while I'm on this planet, remembering you and praising you. If I'm not here, I can't do this for the benefit of the world I live in. Let my soul experience the depth of the psalmist's hurt. I, I may not be worn out by sobbing today, but I have been. I've been so grieved I couldn't see straight. I know very few physical enemies seeking my destruction, but I still fight plenty of battles against the world and my own flesh. Lord, you have saved me to do more than I, I live up to most days. You promised deliverance, and I need you to come through. And then 8 through 10, go away, all you who do, do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord will answer my prayer. May all my enemies be disgraced and terrified. May they suddenly turn back in shame. Father, I praise you because you are a God who hears my prayers. Not only do you hear my prayers, you hear the cries of my heart and the groanings that I don't even have the capacity to verbalize. Because of this, evil doesn't stand a chance. You have heard my prayers and you have reoriented me to your love. You have heard me, oh God. May my enemies be disgraced. Let sin and death be mocked by my life. May they experience shame and be swallowed up in victory because of your work in restoring and growing me. Thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me close with one final prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Father, for all you continue to do through your people here at North Isani Baptist Church. We ask, oh God, that you will use our times of disorientation, painful disorientation, to bring about, Lord, a surprising reorientation of your love. Let there be a lot of death to self and newness of life among your people here, I pray in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Amen.